Hi, it's Jim Ricketts, and this is uh, Happy Hour. Uh, this is one of the most popular features we did last summer at the uh, Sprott Natural Resource Conference. We had a happy hour. Uh, and for this preview of the next Sprott Natural Resource Conference, uh, we're going to do it again. As I said, it was very popular last summer. Uh, just because we have a virtual conference doesn't mean we can't have a real drink. Uh, so we're going to do that today. Uh, our feature drink is the uh, Vesper Martini. And you say, well, martini, uh, gin, vermouth, what's the big deal? We have those all the time. Uh, it doesn't seem anything special about that. But this is the Vesper Martini. Some of you may know what I'm talking about, but for the whole audience, uh, we'll explain in detail. Vesper was the first name of Vesper Lind. By the way, Vesper means evening uh, in Latin, so it's the evening hour or the evening cocktail. Uh, Vesper Lind was the first uh, so-called Bond girl. She was James Bond's love interest in the first novel written by Ian Fleming, which was Casino Royale. So if you're the movie fan, it was not the first movie, but it was the first novel So uh, by Ian Fleming, of course. So she was the original Bond girl. She was working for the KGB. She was working for the Russians, but she was, had infiltrated MI6, the British um, intelligence service, the foreign intelligence service. So she was a double agent. Uh, she was assigned to Bond by an unknowing MI6 to work with him on a mission. Uh, became a love interest, of course, but the fact that she was a double agent working for the KGB, that wasn't going to work out too well. In the end, uh, she committed suicide. Sorry, I should have said spoiler alert, spoiler alert. Uh, but she committed suicide. Bond was distraught because he was in love with her. Uh, and he invented this martini and called it the Vesper, the Vesper Martini in honor or memory of Vesper Lynn. So that's the background. That's where the name comes from. But still, you might say, well, okay, fine. It's just, the, uh, just gin and vermouth. What's the big deal? It's not just gin and vermouth. That's the thing. So I'm going to read to you the, um, the actual dialogue, very famous. This is from the novel Casino Royale. They, they played it pretty much uh, the same in the movie, but I'll just read this very quickly. So, um, so this is James Bond, Felix Leiter. Felix Leiter, of course, worked for the, the CIA. James Bond worked for MI6, uh, 007. Uh, they're in a cafe in Monaco, because that's where Casino Royale took place. Uh, they're seated, and the waiter comes over, and here's the dialogue, uh, starting with Bond. A dry martini, he said, one, in a deep champagne goblet. Oui, monsieur. Just a moment. Three measures of Gordon's, one of vodka, half a measure of Kina Lille. Shake it very well until it's ice cold, then add a large, thin slice of lemon peel. Got it? Certainly, monsieur. The barman seemed pleased with the idea. Gosh, that's certainly a drink, said Leiter. Bond laughed. Well, I'm uh, concentrating, he explained. I never had more than one drink before dinner, but I do like that one to be large and very strong and very cold and very well made. I hate small portions of anything, particularly when they taste bad. This drink's my own invention. I'm going to patent it when I think of a good name. So that was the, those are the lines from Casino Royale, the first James Bond novel written by Ian Fleming, where Bond invents what became known as the uh, Vesper Martini. Now, he didn't call it the Vesper Martini at the time. That came later in the novel after Vesper Lynn died when he said, I'm going to, uh, to uh, call it the, uh, the Vesper Martini. Okay, so what's in a Vesper Martini? What are the ingredients here? Um, well, for here, uh, I will uh, show you what's in it, but uh, I'm going to start with this briefcase. And you're probably saying to yourself, well, why do we need an attache case? Why do we need an attache case at the bar? What's the attache case doing? Well, if you're a real Bond fan, you recognize this attache case. This was the uh, original case uh, from the movie uh, From Russia With Love. If you recall the scene, Q, Q did all the armaments and special gadgets for Bond, and Q presented Bond with this attache case before he went to uh, Istanbul in the, uh, in the movie. And he very carefully explained, he said, pay attention, Bond. And he showed how a dagger came out of the side, and if you turn the latches a certain way and you opened it, a tear gas canister would explode. Inside was uh, an AR-7, which is a, a, a rifle, an accurate rifle that actually folds up into a very compact unit. So this is the actual um, James Bond briefcase from, uh, they're made by Swain and Adney in London. Uh, but if you recognize the black, the brass, the handle, etc., and of course the red uh, interior, um, this is the original case. Now, one of the things that Bond had in the case, in addition to the AR-7, uh, he had, was given 10 British gold sovereigns uh, by the Her Majesty's Treasury uh, to, you know, use for bribes or getting out of trouble or whatever. Uh, we have, sir, uh, we have 10 
Uh, these are not sovereigns, these are American gold eagles, but they're one quarter ounce. They're not the one ounce eagles that you may be familiar with. They're, they're one quarter ounce eagles, but they're eight grams, roughly the size of a British sovereign. So updated for the 21st century. We've got the, uh, we've got the 10, uh, 10 gold coins that James Bond had in his briefcase. Sorry, and as I mentioned, this is the uh, original briefcase. But I left out the tear gas and the weapons, or at least I hope I did. And uh, inside, we have the ingredients of the uh, Vesper Martini. Um, one of them is Lille. I'll put it right here. You notice I have two kinds of gin. I'll explain why in a minute. There's Bombay gin, Gordon's gin, bitters, and I'll explain all this. So uh, again, you recognize the original case with the leather straps and the red lining, etc. But this is a uh, James Bond. Uh, uh, this is authentic. Uh, it's the real one from London, and so we'll put this aside. But just that we add to the James Bond uh, allure with that uh, briefcase. Now let's get down to the drink. What's in a uh, Vesper Martini? Well, I have the uh, ingredient list right here, and this is uh, from, uh, well, we actually know because James Bond said it, uh, Gordon's Gin, vodka, he did not mention the brand of vodka, but he did say vodka, half a measure of quinoa lile and lemon peel, uh, and shaken, not stirred. By the way, what about that line, shaken, not stirred? You're, you're, most people associate that with James Bond ordering a martini. He didn't say it in Casino Royale. I read to you from the actual novel. Uh, he, did, he said, uh, shake it very well until it's ice cold, but didn't say shake and not stir it. However, Bond did say that in many other movies. I'll read that quickly. Um, it says, the phrase first appears in the novel Diamonds Are Forever, 1956. The Bond himself does not actually say it until Dr. No, 1958, where his exact words were shaken and not stirred. In the film ad adaptations of Fleming's novels, the phrase is first uttered by the villain, Dr. Julius No, in the movie Dr. No. It's not spoken by Bond himself until Goldfinger in 1964, and it's used in not numerous Bond films since then. So, yes, Bond did say um, shaken, not stirred, said it many times, but he did not say those exact words when he created the, uh, the Vesper uh, Martini. Um, so that said, we, we know the ingredients. Uh, so Gordon's gin, uh, quinoa lile, um, a little ice, shake it up, what's the big deal? Why can't we make that easily? Well, here's where the problems begin. And believe it or not, this drink requires some interpretation. Lile, and I have it right here, uh, has been made by the Lile family. It's a brand, uh, but it's also a particular uh, drink. It's a fortified wine, as they call it, white wine, with a lot of botanicals and gardens, uh, garden uh, uh, herbs and, and, uh, and so forth. Uh, but there's a problem which is that the original Kina Lile that Bond specified in the novel and in the movie uh, includes a chincona bark, and that's from a tree in South America, which is the source of quinine, if you're English, or quinine if you're American. Uh, but, uh, but quinine comes from the bark of that uh, chincona tree from South America, and they used to put it in the Lile, and that's why it was called Kina Lile. Again, Kina is sort of cognate with, uh, with quinine or quinine or uh, chincona, which is the name of the barks. That's where the name Kina Lile came from. But the, the Lile family stopped making Kina Lile in the early 1980s. You can't get it. They don't make it anymore. If you have a 30-year-old bottle in, in your liquor cabinet, good for you. But uh, most people don't, and you can't get it because they don't make it anymore. Now, Lile is identical to that in every respect except for the bark, which again is the basis for, for quinine. So why was it in there in the first place? Well, the answer is just to give it a little bitterness. The wine can be a little sweet, uh, but that gives it just a little bit of bitterness. So, so what do we do if we don't have that original ingredient? Well, our solution, mixologists have different ideas, but they use the, the Lile, which has everything else I just described, and three dashes of bitters. We have uh, Angostura bitters, which are top of the line. So three dashes of bitters, plus the original formula will get us back to something very much like the Kina Lile. It's as, it's as close as you can get. There, what, there is one other, um, one other substitute that's uh, fairly popular. It's called a Coqui Americano. Uh, it's, a, again, a fortified wine, uh, an aperitif wine, very much like the Lile. It actually has uh, the bark of the uh, Chincona in it, so it has the original formula, if you will, of Kina Lile. Uh, I tried getting it. Uh, went to a huge liquor store, they said, well, we, we know what you mean, but we'd have to special order it, we don't have it. So you really have two choices. You can use Lile with bitters, and that gets you very close to the Kina Lile, or order this uh, 
uh, Kochi Americano, uh, and get it white because there's a rosé version, but get the white. Uh, either one is fine, but that will get you as close as it is possible to get to the original Kino Lile. So, so that's why I say a little interpretation is required, but we're going to get there. Now, the second thing, Gordon, uh, uh, Bond said Gordon's Gin. Okay, well, Gordon's Gin is very popular, great brand. I have a bottle of it right here, but there's only one problem. The Gordon's Gin that Bond used in the 1950s was 94 proof. So that's 47% alcohol. Today, they only make it 80 proof. There is a, a small batch of 94 proof. It's hard to get. You, you can't get it in the United States. You probably get it in, uh, in the UK. So this is authentic Gordon's Gin, but it's only 80 proof. But remember, from the script that I read to you, Bond said, um, I like my drinks very strong and very cold. So if Bond was using 94 proof vodka in the 1950s, uh, sorry, gin, I'm talking about the gin. If he was using 94 proof gin in the 1950s, we want to use 94 proof gin today because we want to be as authentic as possible to what Bond was actually ordering in the 1950s. So if Gordon's won't cut it because they di dilute it with water, it's only 80 proof, uh, you, can get, uh, you can get 94 proof gin. Uh, it's right here, Bombay Sapphire, there's a couple others. Tanqueray has it. Uh, so what you want is a very high quality gin with good botanical elements, a good flavor of gin, but you want it to be strong. It's basically 47% alcohol, 94, uh, sorry, 94, uh, that's right, 94 proof, 47% alcohol, but that's what this is. So this is 94 proof. So this is the alcohol content of the original Gordons that Bond was using in the 1950s. So with the Lille, the bitters, and the Bombay vodka, uh, sorry, gin, I keep saying vodka, but the, uh, with the gin, the, the, the sapphire gin, we get back to the original formula as close as we can. Now, there's one other ingredient, and again, this is subject to interpretation, which was vodka. Remember, that's why it's not the ordinary martini. You have uh, um, uh, vodka martinis and gin martinis. The great thing about the Vesper martini is it has both. So let's talk about the vodka for a second. Now there, Bond did not specify a brand. Obviously, you want something uh, premium quality. But in a later um, uh, part of the book, um, and I'm quoting here, in the same scene, Bond gives more details about the Vesper. Telling the barman that the vodka made from grain instead of potatoes makes the drink even better. Well, this is another dilemma. In other words, the original Vesper martini was potato-based vodka, but we have Bond saying, yeah, fine, but I would prefer grain-based vodka, you know, wheat or corn or some other kind of vodka. So what do we do? Uh, I have some grain-based vodka here, uh, Tito's, very good brand. So, but the, the dilemma is, do we stick with the original, which was potato-based, or do we go with grain because Bond said that makes it even better? Uh, it's a judgment call. Uh, I'll, I'm going to go with the potato because we're trying to go as close as possible to the original. And besides that, uh, Bond did say, Bond always drank Polish or Russian vodka. So uh, what I have here is uh, uh, the Lu Luxusova. Uh, it's, uh, it's Polish, uh, which is pretty close to Russia. But more importantly, it's potato vodka and it's good quality. So we're, uh, as I say, there's a lot more interpretation here than you might expect. But with the bitters added to the Lille, with the Bombay 94 uh, uh, proof uh, vodka instead of the Gordon's 80 proof, and the Polish uh, potato vodka, we're as close as you can possibly get to the original, bearing in mind that you can't do the original because the ingredients no longer exist. But we're, I think we're there. Uh, and with that said, let's, uh, let's go ahead and put this together. So um, start with some ice, because we know Bond likes his drinks very cold. Uh, and we'll start with uh, three measures of the gin. And bear with me. So I'm going to get my, I know the recipe, but I want to get it right in front of me so there's no mistake. So I'm going to start out with, I said three measures. I'm going to start out with three ounces of, uh, of gin. And I got a measuring type of shot glass right here. Three ounces of gin. One ounce of vodka. Got to get this just right. There's one ounce of vodka. A half ounce of the Lille. This is a little on the sweeter side, but it's supposed to be. Oh, 
get a grip on this because these twist off caps aren't always easy. Well, that's uh, the wonders of a uh, of a uh, TV interviews. You never know what's going to happen. But uh, we move this cat. Well, this is hard to get into. It's like breaking into Fort Knox and Goldfinger. Okay, so uh, half ounce of Kino Lule. Let's get that right. And remember, we have to add the three dashes of bitters to substitute for the quina, which is the missing ingredient, but that's okay. We're doing, we're gonna get back to that bitterness. So one, two, three. And that's our substitute for the uh, missing quina bark. Okay, that said, put this together. And remember, shaken, not stirred. You want to shake it for a long time, you want it good and cold, you don't do this for um, 10 seconds or 15 seconds, you can do this. Some people have songs and they complete the entire song while they're shaking. So that's, uh, that's what a serious bartender will do. You go into Harry's Bar in Venice or um, you know, in, in your favorite bar anywhere in the world, uh, a good bartender will do exactly what I'm doing now, which is really shake it up extremely well. So uh, we'll do this for another uh, 30 seconds or so. but. By the way, um, the debate, let's well, say most martini drinker, drinkers say, well, I stir my martini. I don't care what James Bond did. James Bond um, insisted on shaken, not stirred. But there's actually scientific evidence behind this. A medical school in the UK, in London, did a study, and they showed that when you shake gin, you actually increase the antioxidants. It has to do with the uh, release of some chemicals uh, in the gin itself and some of the sub-ingredients I mentioned in the Lule, but it actually is healthy for you because you're going to get more antioxidant power from your martini when you shake it up. So that's probably good enough. And uh, you need a strainer. This one has a, a strainer built in, but if not, you can use a strainer, but we don't have that. This is about pure alcohol, by the way. There's not too much else in here. Um, I'll see if I think I can pour two, even though Bond, Bond would have had one. He liked, remember, he liked them cold, well-made, and big. But we'll, we'll share this in honor of uh, James Bond and Vesper Lynn. And one last act, coup de grace, which is the lemon uh, peel. Uh, not, a, uh, not a wedge, but just a lemon peel. And there we are. So this is, uh, to the extent it's even possible today in the 21st century, this is the closest to the original authentic Vesper martini. And here's to the uh, success of the uh, Sprout Conference, and here's to James Bond and the best to win. Delicious, it's very good. Hope you enjoy it. You can make this at home. <laughs>